Chào các bạn, chào mừng đã quay trở lại với học IELTS với Les. Thầy là Huy đây. Bạn chỉ được nghe đúng một lần duy nhất và sau đó sẽ là thời gian để trả lời câu hỏi. Giả sử các bạn nghe đúng theo kịch bài, các bạn sẽ không thể nào tổng hợp được các ý cần thiết để có thể trả lời câu hỏi. Vì thế, khi thi IELTS listening, các bạn cần phải có một khả năng phản xạ cực kỳ nhạy bén để nhận ra được thông tin nào quan trọng cần phải ghi nhớ. Nào, có thể thấy được nghe bài số 24 trong chuỗi series IELTS listening test ngày hôm nay nhé. The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. You'll hear a head teacher and a teacher discussing a school camping trip. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning, Mr. Thompson. Can I speak to you for a moment? Of course, Jamie. Come in. Have a seat. I've just finished looking through the reports for this term. It looks like the pupils are doing very well. Yes, I think they are. It's all going fine. So, Jamie... What's on your mind? Well, I've been thinking about next month's camping trip, the one for year 10. Yes, we've got it scheduled for the 23rd to the 26th, if I'm not mistaken. Ah, uh, actually, I think it's the 24th to the 27th. Let's just check. Oh, right. Yes, yes, you're right. So... Well, I've been thinking about how we might possibly make this year's event even better than last year's. Not that last year's wasn't great, but... Suggestions for improvement are always welcome, Jamie. So, what have you been thinking about? Well, to tell the truth, I wasn't completely happy with the camp we used last year. It was rather small, and I didn't feel that the grounds were particularly well kept. Go on. I did some searching, and I think I found the perfect spot. It's called Shepton Meadows, and... Is that the campsite in the Lake District? No. Actually, it's just outside Carlisle. It's a huge site, and it's on a lovely lake, Lake Brant, I believe it's called. Half the site is forested, and the rest, the actual camping area, is grassy. For kids that rarely get to see anything more than concrete, it's ideal. And the facilities are amazing. There's a basketball court, a large pool, and a football pitch. There are well-marked trails through the forest for hiking, and the lake is there for swimming and other water sports. I believe there's even a lifeguard service. That sounds like it might suit our purposes perfectly. Did you happen to find out about availability and cost? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. I called them yesterday evening, and there are plenty of spots available. And because we're a non-profit organisation, they said they would give me a reduction in the price. If I remember correctly, we paid £5 a head last year. Yes, per night, right? Yes, each child paid £10 for the two nights. Well, at this campsite, it's only £4 per night. And they told me that if we had over 50 children, which we do, they could give us a further 10% off. That's very reasonable, isn't it? Well, from what you've told me, I think we should probably go ahead and book. Excellent. I'm sure the children will love it. I'm sure they will. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, Jamie, have you given any thought to an itinerary by any chance? As a matter of fact, I have. Wait one second. Yes, here it is. 
I've made a few notes. Okay, so, now, these are just ideas, of course. Yes, yes, go on. Let's hear what you've got. Right. We time it so that we arrive at the camp around 7 on Friday evening. It'll still be light then, and we'll have plenty of time to set up camp and get ourselves settled in. At 8, we could have a barbecue, you know, hamburgers and hot dogs, something that's nice and easy to prepare. And that children love. Yes. Then, lights out would be at 9.30, so the children will get a good night's sleep and be up bright and early at 7 on Saturday morning. Breakfast would be at 7.30, an hour's hiking from 8 till 9, and then a couple of hours at the lake. That would take us up to 11. I think that an hour of free time would then be in order. Let them have a chance to explore a bit on their own, you know? Yes, great idea. And then? Let's see, a picnic lunch at 12, and then sports in the afternoon till 4. Another swim until 5, and then supper. After clean-up, around 6.30, we could have a talk-back session, where the children get a chance to discuss their day and anything else they might have on their minds. Then a campfire and sing-along at 8, back to the tents at 9.30, and, well, that takes care of Saturday. Excellent. Excellent. That would certainly keep them busy. What about Sunday? Sunday, right. As on Saturday, same wake-up and breakfast times, and then I thought we could go on a bit of a day trip. There are some caves about an hour's walk from the camp, which I thought the children might find interesting. We could leave at eight, which would mean we'd get to the caves at nine. They could explore for a couple of hours, and we'd head back at eleven. Twelve o'clock would see us back at the meadows. An hour's swim, and then lunch at one. Then we could have organised games in the afternoon until supper at five. It would take us an hour to clean up our sights and pack up. We'd be on the buses at six and all set to head back into the city. Well now, you've certainly put a lot of thought into this, Jamie, and it's paid off. I think it sounds wonderful. I can't think of a thing that needs to be changed. Let's go for it. Brilliant. I'll get the itinerary printed up and put it up on the notice board this afternoon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear a discussion between two students, Rosie and Mike, and a university tutor. In the first part of the discussion, they're talking about a survey they have conducted on local entertainment. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Good morning, everyone. Well, I think we can start straight away by getting Rosie and Mike to do their presentation. Would you like to start, Rosie? Yes. Well, um, we've done a survey on local entertainment. Basically, we tried to find out how students feel about the entertainment in the town and how much they use it. Yes, so we've called our project Out and About. Yes, that's a good title, Out and About. We wanted to find out how well students use the entertainment facilities in town, whether they get to see the latest plays, films, that kind of thing. Now, we have our own facilities on campus, of course. Oh, yes. We deliberately omitted those as we really wanted to examine outside entertainment in the town as opposed to on the university campus. Actually, there were a lot of areas to choose from, 
but in the end, we limited ourselves to looking at three general categories. Cinema, theatre and music. Right. OK, well, uh, first of all, cinema. In the town, there are three main places where you can see films. There's the new multi-screen cinema complex, the old park cinema and a late-night Odeon. So, if you look at this chart, in terms of audience size, the multi-screen complex accounts for 75% of all cinema seats. The park cinema accounts for 20% of seats and the late night Odeon has just 5% of seats. As you probably know, the complex and the park show all the latest films, while the late night cinema tends to show cult films. So, when we interviewed the students, we thought the complex would be the most popular choice of cinema. But surprisingly, it was the late night Odeon. Yeah, and most students said that if they wanted to see a new film, they waited for it to show at the park because the complex is more expensive and further out of town, so you have to pay more to get there as well. Yes, and that adds to the cost, of course, and detracts from the popularity, evidently. Well, next, we looked at theatres. The results here were interesting because, as you know, there's a theatre on campus, which is popular, but there's also the stage theatre in town, which is very old and architecturally quite beautiful. And there's the large modern theatre, the Ashtop, that has recently been built. So you just looked at the two theatres in town? Yes, but the thing about the theatres is that there's a whole variety of seat prices. Also, the types of performance vary. So students tend to buy seats at both and like using both for different reasons. And if they want cheap seats at the Ashtop, they can just sit further from the front. What we did find that was very interesting is that there are periods during the year when students seem to go to the theatre and periods when they go to the cinema. And we really think that's to do with budget. If you look at this graph, you can see that um, there's a peak around November, December when they go to the theatre more, and then a period in April, May when neither is particularly popular and then uh, theatre viewing seems to trail off virtually while the cinema becomes quite popular in June, July. Hmm. I think you're probably right about your conclusions. In the second part of the discussion, Rosie and Mike talk about different music clubs. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Well, lastly, we looked at music, and this time we were really investigating the sort of small music clubs that offer things like folk or specialise in local bands. So not musicals as such? That's right. We looked at three small music venues and we examined the quality of the entertainment and the venue and gave a ranking for these. A cross, meaning that the quality was poor, a tick, meaning it was OK, and two ticks for excellent. First of all, the Blues Club, which obviously specialises in blues music. This was a pretty small place and the seating was minimal, so we didn't give that a very good rating. No, we don't recommend that one, really. Then the Sansu, which plays a lot of South American music. It was a big place, very lively, good performers, so two ticks for that one. The Pier Hotel is a folk venue, a good place for local and up-and-coming folk artists to play. Not the best of venues, as it's in a basement and a bit dark, but the quality of the entertainment was reasonable and the lighting was very warm, so we felt it deserved an average rating. Now, finally, there's the Bald Rock Cafe, which features big rock bands and is pretty popular with students, and we enjoyed ourselves there as well, so top marks for that one. 
And then, did you get any information from the students as to which of the clubs they preferred? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion among three students who are organizing an international film festival at their college. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully to the first part of the discussion and answer questions 21 to 24. Thanks for coming to this meeting on such short notice, Anna and Veronica. It looks like we have just become the organising committee for this year's International Film Festival. We've all just met, so perhaps we should start by an introduction with a bit of background from each of us. OK, I'm Anna. I finished three years of a languages degree in Sweden, where I come from. This year I decided to study overseas to get to know a different part of the world. I'm also a big fan of European cinema, especially French and Italian. Those are the languages I majored in, along with English. To me, film is a great way to learn about the rest of the world. I was in the film club at my university, so when I saw the notice asking for volunteers, I thought it would be a good way to meet people and get involved in something I really enjoy. Thanks, Anna. My name is Veronica and I come from Italy. I'm doing graduate studies in English literature. I went to some of the films in the festival last year and enjoyed them. I especially liked the video interviews. That was when I decided to get involved. I used to do film reviews for our student newspaper back home. Hi, I'm Chris from Scotland and I'm in fourth year journalism. Cinema is my hobby. Last year I joined the organising committee just like you have now and somehow this year I've ended up in charge. I'm actually able to use my coordinating work on the festival towards a credit for one of my courses. I have to write up a report on the festival with recommendations, so that's an extra motivation for me. So I hope this is going to be a good experience for us all. OK, where would you like to start? How about a general overview of the festival? I don't really know much about it. Well, the film festival was started by International Student Society five years ago and has grown every year. It is held over four nights during study break. Wednesday to Saturday. Normally we show three films a night. Last year we tried to choose films from different parts of the world that fit together in some way, maybe a similar theme. Or we could feature a type of film like action films or science fiction. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 25 to 30. Who picks the films? It's up to us on the committee to decide. You mean we get to pick all the films ourselves? What a hard decision. There are so many to choose from. Well, that's the fun part. We have this catalogue of independent distributors. The films are listed by language and have a short summary. 
we just have to go through it to find a good combination of films that will attract an audience. Veronica mentioned something about interviews. How does that fit in? We set up cameras in the foyer of the theatre and did live interviews before, during intermission and after the screening. Anyone from the audience could come up and talk about the film. The Broadcasting and Journalism School set it up and ran the interviews. They were shown on big screens around the lobby and in the theatre. It went over really well. We had a long lineup of students waiting to be interviewed on TV. Everybody wanted their minute of fame. Great idea. Yeah, it worked really well. We should certainly do something similar again. Maybe even develop the idea further, like a website with audience reviews and discussion, so we can get as much participation and involvement as possible. Hey, that's a good idea. Can I ask a question? None of the films are in English, right? Are they dubbed or subtitled? Well... We do occasionally choose a film in English, but only from unusual places where the dialect is so strong they sometimes need subtitles, like the Caribbean or even Scotland. The majority of films in the festival are foreign language, dubbed in English. We've learned from experience that students don't like reading subtitles. Maybe they read too much already. Whatever the reason, the subtitled films get smaller audiences, so we avoid them as much as possible. So how large an audience can we expect and how much does it cost to get in? It costs $5 per film or a $20 pass for the whole event, all 12 films for the real movie fan. We would have broken even last year except for a bad storm on the Friday night. We almost had to cancel the whole thing. But overall, we had a good turnout, more than 2,000 people in four days. Oh, that's what I was wondering about, the financial part. Where does the funding come from? What kind of budget do we have? The festival is subsidised by the Student Council. We generate money through advertising and through admission charges. We'll go over the budget in details a little later, but we've got lots of work to do in the meantime. I guess we have to start pretty soon. Well, I think by the 1st of March at the latest. We need to select all the films. Then we have to find some advertisers to sponsor the event. That shouldn't be too hard. We'll just start with last year's list. Our deadline for that should be the middle of March. By the end of March, we need to design the programme. Then we can get posters made up and distributed in April. Like you said, we need some clever promotion. Something to generate interest and get people talking. We have four months to get ready. It should be enough time. OK, where do we start? Let's start by talking about films, since that is the best part, and see what we come up with. What was the best film you saw last year? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a teacher talking about several British art galleries. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 33. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 33. Good afternoon. Welcome to the first class of V100 Art and History. The objectives of the course, as you will have seen if you've taken a look at the syllabus, include familiarizing yourselves with the vocabulary and language of art, learning about the basic elements of art and design, and finally, discussing historical periods as they pertain to art. 
The course will also give you the opportunity to visit some of the many galleries and museums that Britain has to offer. So, having said that, I'd like to spend the rest of today's class talking about four of the more important galleries that we will be visiting in the coming year. As most of you already know, or at least I hope most of you know, there are four Tate galleries in all. To begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Tate Modern. Tate Modern is located in a very busy part of London called the South Bank. It's close to two world-renowned tourist attractions, St. Paul's Cathedral and Shakespeare's Globe Theatre. Now, interestingly enough, Tate Modern is housed in what was a power station, built in several stages between 1947 and 1963. It was closed down in 1981 and reopened as a gallery in the year 2000. Tate Modern consists of five levels, with the Tate Collection being shown on the third and fifth levels. On level two, the works of contemporary artists are exhibited, while level four is used for holding large temporary exhibitions. Since this museum opened, it has become a popular spot for both Londoners and tourists alike. And believe it or not, it doesn't cost anything to get in to see the collection displays. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 34 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 34 to 40. Now, the second gallery I'd like to talk about is Tate St. Ives, which is in Cornwall. It was built on the site of a gas works, and it overlooks Porthmeor Beach. Tate St. Ives is housed in a three-story building that was designed by the architects Evans and Shalliff. It was established in 1993, seven years before Tate Modern was opened, and the gallery exhibits the works of modern British artists, including members of the St. Ives School, a group of artists living and working in the area from the 30s onwards. In later lectures, we'll be looking at the work of some of the artists who belong to that group and the ways in which they influenced each other. Okay, am I going too fast for any of you? No? Good. Next, I want to talk about Tate Britain, which is a gorgeous gallery situated right in the heart of Westminster. Tate Britain was the first of the four Tate galleries to open, and it was established in 1897. It was built on the site of an old prison, and when it first opened its doors, it was called the National Gallery of British Art. Later, it became known as the Tate Gallery, after the man who founded it, Sir Henry Tate. During its lifetime, Tate Britain has been damaged twice, once by floodwaters from the River Thames, and once by bombings during World War II. This gallery has an interesting range of exhibitions of historic and modern art from 1500 up to the present day. Now, the last gallery I'd like to tell you about is called Tate Liverpool. It's not hard to figure out where this gallery is located, is it? It was opened in 1988 to exhibit displays from the Tate Collection and it also has a program of temporary exhibitions. Tate Liverpool is housed in what was once a warehouse, and for some years it was one of the biggest galleries of modern and contemporary art in the UK. Well, that's a brief overview of just a few of the galleries we'll be visiting. 
I'd like now to look in a little more detail at what you can expect to see in each of these galleries, starting with Tate Britain. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet. Vậy là bài test ngày hôm nay đã hết rồi. Các bạn cần có thêm bất kỳ thông tin nào nữa hay không? Hãy bình luận cho thầy ngay ý kiến của các bạn hay phía dưới phần bình luận. Còn bây giờ chào các bạn, hẹn gặp lại các bạn trong video ngày hôm sau.